Dr. Parks, Dr. are you ready for questions? Is he, he may be frozen in time. Dr. Parks. Sorry, you asked me a question? Yeah. Yes, we have Q&A coming up. <coughs> uh, somebody asked if you, you were giving away $100 and, and gold coins or something. Uh, is that true? <laughs> Dr. Parks? I'm, I'm sorry, Steve, I did not hear the question. It, it was, uh, are you giving, <coughs> giving away $100 in gold coins or silver or anything? I'm sorry, I'm not hearing the question, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> are you giving away a <laughs> hundred? Are you give, let me increase it a little bit? Are you giving away uh, five hundred dollars in silver or gold coins? Somebody mentioned that earlier. Actually, we're just giving away irredeemable paper ticket money. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much secrecy and malfeasance. Uh, this whole thing can collapse while I'm speaking to you. However, that should not dissuade anybody from getting started. I mean, you have to get started. Uh, it's, it's like you know that this, the roof is going to cave in. Uh, you don't know when it's going to cave in, but you know it is going to cave in. You have to start making preparations. And the best way to make preparations is, is what you're doing at the state level. Another way to do that, I mean, Ron Paul has legislation pending in some committee. It's called the Competition and Currency Act. It gets rid of legal tender. That's the coercion in the system. It gets rid of all taxation on gold and silver, and it opens the mints to free coinage. That legislation uh, would be very helpful as well. And uh, this thing that Ed was talking about, having an alternate currency, that is very, very important. Because if you look at all the currency collapses around the world, in every case, they had an alternate currency. And that alternate currency was the dollar. What's the alternate currency for the dollar? And in that first presentation I showed you is that we're naked here. Ordinary people don't have any gold. Dr. Parks, do you want to talk about Superman, your metaphor you gave on the radio show recently? Well, the business about what, what's, up, what's holding the uh, dollar up, I used to have this metaphor for the Superman 2 movie. And it starts off, there's this helicopter that's about to come land on what was then the Pan Am building, not the uh, MetLife building, as it now. And it hits a guide wire, and it tips over. And as it tips over, it turns out that Lois Lane is in the helicopter. She's falling down the Pan Am building to certain death. But fortunately, Clark Kent is on the ground. He sees it. And in a flash, he's in his Superman costume, and he jumps up and he catches her in midair, and the dialogue goes like this. Uh, Superman says to Lois, he says, don't worry, miss, he says, I've got you. And Lois says to Superman, but who's got you? Now that's the dollar holding up all of these currencies. When the dollar goes, they all go. And so really, this is a worldwide issue. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Dr. Parks, hi. My name is Zach Stafford. I am. Uh, I run a precious metals bullion store in Greenville, South Carolina. My question is to you, in my own personal studies of this system, uh, the problem with our current debt-based system is there is no uh, numeraire. There is no uh, valuation for this new gold standard that we're going to implement, not necessarily a gold standard, but a gold coinage, gold silver coinage as a uh, state currency, how is that going to be valued in something that uh, normal people will be able to understand and implement in a quick fashion? Will it be something that the state will decla uh, declare like it was back in the, uh, in the 30s, a strict, uh, a strict uh, uh, basically a strict backing $35 to one ounce of gold, or will it be on a free market system like, like the euro is today, like uh, you know, a mark-to-market type of valuation? How will, how will people understand that? I, I understand your question. And the answer is, we don't want to peg gold to some amount of irredeemable paper ticket money. We want the coins denominated by weight, and that's what the founders really meant and they defined the dollar as 371.25 grains of silver. And that definition just made into law was already a fact. So, it's, so, the, so the numenera, the word dollar or peso or any of these things, these are just an amount of weight. And what we would like to see is those, kind, those coins say one ounce or half an ounce or whatever. As to the relative valuation, you know, in terms of uh, the irredeemable paper ticket money, that's up to the free market. 
And I can pretty much guarantee you that anyone who's saving for the future, uh, they will want to save the uh, species, the gold and silver, rather than the irredeemable paper tickets. And the example that I like to give, I don't know if you can, well, I, I don't have it handy, but here in New York, we have what they call us to get uh, mass transit on the subway of buses. It's a little card which you stick into this turnstile. It is better than money. It's better than money because you can get 100 rides on it. Uh, it's quicker. It fits easily in your wallet. You don't have to fumble around with coins. It's better than money. However, who in their right mind would take Metro cards? And so the same thing with the irredeemable paper ticket money. For day-to-day -day purchases, makes no difference. You get paid, you go to the grocery, you do whatever, you buy it, it's gone. Who cares whether it's gold or silver? But for a future payment, for your pensions, for your annuities, for your savings, for any kind of insurance, you want to be sure that what you get will have value. And you can be absolutely 100% sure that the paper ticket money is not going to have any value. They tell you it's not going to have any value. And so when, when uh, a veteran Aki, the, the Fed chairman, tells you that he's going to do target inflation, inflation, target inflation, he's telling you honestly that they're going to reduce the value of the money year by year. Why would you save something like that? Why don't you save something that you know is going to appreciate year by year, and that's gold. But again, we do not want to peg it to link to redeem it any amount of paper ticket money. Gold and silver stand by themselves. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Come on up. Dr. Parks, my name is Cindy Mosteller, and my question is, on a personal level, uh, if some of us begin to purchase gold, what would protect us? Do we need federal legislation that would prevent the government from a repeat of the 1933 prohibition or outlawing of citizenry possessing gold and or silver? Thank you. At the end of the day, you know, the government has the monopoly on the use of force, the legal monopoly on the use of force, and I mean, uh, by law, people are allowed to defend themselves, but you're never allowed to defend yourself against government, which is why, by the way, the founders wrote into the Second Amendment that the uh, right to bear arms shall not be infringed. But today, we don't have that right. And there is, as a practical matter, there is no way to prevent the government from confiscating anything. And one of the things that does not make it into the major media there are hundreds, not a hundred, but hundreds of laws on the books today uh, augmenting what's called the emergency powers. And there's a Senate report on the emergency powers, uh, which really empower the government to do anything they want. I mean, they can, they can declare martial law, they can put people to live in your house, uh, they can command the uh, communication system, the transportation system. Uh, this came about big time in 1933, uh, as when Roosevelt took office in his inaugural speech he says to the people, his words, he says, I'm going to ask Congress for the one, his word, extraordinary remaining power as if we had been invaded by a foreign foe. He's talking about the commander in chief power over the nation. And on March 9th, 1933, in a piece of legislation called the Emergency Banking Act of 1933, they gave it to him and they declared an emergency. And so, for example, when Roosevelt uh, uh, sequestered all the Japanese Americans uh, into internment camps during World War II. There was no legislation for that. That was done pursuant to an executive order, pursuant to some emergency powers. When President Nixon uh, uh, instituted wage and price controls on August 15, 1971, which is the time that he defaulted on the last sovereign promise to redeem gold to foreign bank, foreign central governments, and foreign central banks, he, there was no legislation for that. He did it pursuant to his emergency powers. In 1973, when Frank Church had the Foreign Senate Relations Committee, he said, look, 40 years have gone, uh, the emergency's over, let's get rid of all these emergency power laws. And they did a little survey, they identified something like 450 additional laws that had been passed to augment the emergency powers, and the bottom line is, they couldn't repeal them. Anybody who sends me a uh, email, I will send you the Senate report. And in the Senate report, they tell you right out, they can seize, do anything they want. And when President Bush was, uh, 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 Bush II was president, prior to his leaving office, he had on the White House website, I don't know if it's still there, but I downloaded it, I have it, a, a Homeland National Security Directive, which said, in so many words, in the event of a catastrophe, uh, the president could seize the whole government. And they had a whole list of catastrophes. And one of those catastrophes was that people lose confidence in the financial system. So the bottom line is, as a practical matter, since the government has a monopoly on the use of force, if they want to confiscate anything, 
They want to take you, take your house, take anything they want. You are the fence. As a as uh, what I expect will happen is that there's not going to be any confiscation of gold because there's not enough gold to go around. Americans don't own any gold. Any, any more questions? Hardly any gold. I mean, there's seven trillion dollars worth of gold above ground. That's a lot of money. You know anybody who's got say a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of gold? Maybe this sort of even does, but. Uh, let me tell you, uh, here where I live in New York City, nobody has any gold. Maybe they have a wedding. That's it. Okay. Any more questions? Should I come? Come on. This is Josiah Magnuson in Taylor's, South Carolina, uh, with the Young Christian Leaders Alliance. Uh, Dr. Parks, I just wondered. Um, one of the hot button topics in our state, as in, of course, a lot of states, is the issue of jobs. And um, invariably, somebody is going to bring this up that, well, uh, if we make uh, more people want uh, gold, then people are not going to be able to get jobs as much because there's not going to be enough gold to go around. And um, the currency is going to uh, be more valuable. The, the gold currency is going to be more valuable than Federal Reserve notes. and so. Um, so some people will lose their jobs. I'm just you know, trying to think ahead. Uh, how would you address that issue? Is, is there any specific point that you might um, bring up to counteract that kind of an argument? Sure. And that's an excellent point, Josiah. And thank, thank you for bringing it up. You know, the Civil War, as I mentioned earlier, was financed with irredeemable paper money called greenbacks. And after the Civil War, again, there was a lot of litigation, a lot of controversy on this. And in 1869, President Grant signed something called the Resumption Legislation to resume gold, which took effect in 1874. That was the most productive time in America in terms of increasing the standard of living for ordinary people. Uh, we, we've never uh, repeated that. So in the event that you have gold as money, you have more investment in productive enterprise, more long-term investment, because people know they're going to get paid at the end. If you have irredeemable paper ticket money, take a look at what happens in Zimbabwe and South America and Africa and whatnot. You end up with massive unemployment. And part of the problem with, uh, uh, I, I take a couple of minutes now. You tell me if you want me to do it, uh, Steve. Uh, I can bring up charts that show how the volatility in, in uh, currency occurred after the last tie to gold is broken. And not only did you have volatility in currency, but you had volatility in all of the basic commodities like oil, copper, boom. Whatnot. And when you have volatility in commodities, you have volatility in the industries that produce those commodities, and you have volatility in the industries that consume those, those uh, commodities. So in the oil industry, for example, a couple of years ago, oil was selling for $30 a barrel. Next thing you know, it's selling for $150 a barrel. And it goes down to $70 a barrel. Today, it's approaching $100 a barrel. Well, if you're in the oil producing business, and you have your plans based on a certain kind of price level, and the price goes down, People get laid off, and then it, you, you can't invest for the future because you don't know what's going to be. But all the all the businesses that use that oil, the airlines, for example, very uh, uh, energy intensive. The next thing you know, you have volatility all over the place, weakened the employment. And so you recall that chart that I put up where I showed the unemployment rate in America prior to the last fight to gold being broken. After the last fight to gold was broken, unemployment took off. But not only did unemployment take off, you also had increased duration in the amount of time people are unemployed. So what people, what ordinary working people want is stability. They want steady work. They want to know their savings are secure. They want to know their pensions are secure. You cannot have stability with uh, irredeemable paper ticket money. And that's part of the problem here. Well, While everybody, working people, ordinary people, uh, small countries want stability, the financial sector does not want stability. They want volatility. Why? Because they make so much money from trading. Tragically, the financial sector has been left in charge of the monetary structure, and they have rigged that structure for their own benefit and to the detriment of everybody else. And it's time for everybody else to put all the facts on the table so everybody can see and restore our system to an honest, stable system. Well, Dr. Parks, that's called transparency, and we're headed that way in South Carolina. And you know, I, I hate the word transparency, but I want full disclosure. Full disclosure. Well, here is making information available to the public so they can make decisions. I know we've got uh, legislators who have been here. Oh, a question. Yes, sir. Come on up. 